So again, let me welcome you to the summer school of the UNB. And uh, I hope you enjoyed yesterday's presentation as much as I did. And you will learn a lot from it. So today we will have uh, in the first session a presentation by Paola Doracchio, who is a research fellow at the research department for closed carb cycles, uh, cycle economics at the Ruhr University in Bochum. And Paola has been dealing with uh, the intersection of monetary policy, financial stability, and climate economics, which is, of course, very dear to our interest as central bankers, but I guess it's also of a lot of interest for many other people. <clears throat> so uh, she deals with research questions like, is the current macroeconomic macroprudential framework free enough? Uh, or is, is not uh, what can be improved. And other topics that she has been dealt, she has dealt with in her research are, for example, also the question whether there are financial constraints uh, as barriers to ecological innovation. I think this will also be, <coughs> sorry, this will also be uh, in the focus of today's presentation. Just uh, to remind you briefly, uh, we would also ask everyone, like yesterday, to mute their microphones. And without much further ado, I would give the floor to Paola and start the presentation, please. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks a lot for the presentation. And so, can you see my screen? Okay, so as anticipated by Wolfgang today, I'm going to uh, present you um, the, 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 the results of a recent paper, so a paper that I published last year uh, uh, on the use of the agent-based modeling approach to study the role of finance in environmental innovation diffusion. So I was saying that before going to the details of the agent-based approach, I would like to uh, give you a, an introduction to the topic and an introduction to the motivation why uh, we carried out this research. Um, so uh, the presentation is related to the paper that Andreas um, shared with you yesterday, uh, which is uh, this one. I also provide you the link here and that we published last year on the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization. And the aim of this research is, first of all, to address the issue of financial constraints, uh, which are usually um, defined in the literature as a relevant barrier to eco-innovation diffusion. Then another aim of the, this, uh, this research is to address the so-called green finance gap and understand how it is related to the uh, ecological uh, technological progress. And finally, uh, the, another aim of this research is to study the role of the public-private partnership uh, through the action of a statement, state investment bank through the so-called subsidiarity principle. So I will define uh, what is the subsidiarity principle uh, later when I, I introduce the model. But for the moment, let's keep in mind these three uh, main aim, uh, aims of the research. So to study the uh, role of financial constraints in eco-innovation diffusion, the fi green finance gap, and if when uh, we have a state investment bank in our system, uh, things go better for eco-innovation uh, diffusion. Uh, by doing so, we would like to contribute to basically uh, two different streams of literature. On the one hand, we, let, we have the uh, very big literature on environmental uh, innovation, uh, environmental innovation and green finance. So this is uh, quite um, quite a big area of research. And then um, the other contribution is to the uh, area of research related to the agent-based modeling. And when we look at the agent-based modeling literature, we see that there are, or there were, uh, several agent-based models that study the role of demand for market dynamics 
And also we have some of these models that look at the interaction among the demand dynamics, the supply side, so the production sector, and the, the innovation dynamics, and also the financial side, which is quite uh, an important actor in these dynamics. And here I just mentioned some of these uh, papers, some of these uh, research contributions that try to link these three different um, features. So demand dynamics, supply side dynamics and innovation, and the financial side. However, when we look at these contributions here, uh, we see that these models basically lack um, the, um, let's say, the, the, the stress on the importance on climate finance. So they have a uh, finance, financial sector in the model, but the financial sector uh, does not deal with uh, climate finance concerns. So we like to introduce these climate finance concerns in our model because we want to see if this can lead us to a, let's say, a better condition for the diffusion of ecological innovation. And so we also would like to contribute to the policy applications of agent-based modeling um, because we want to include very clearly these uh, green finance concerns in the uh, agent-based model that uh, I'm going to present you. Um, so what is the background? Why we are interested in this, uh, in this research? Why we want to have uh, the stress on climate finance in our research? Um, well, there are three basic motivations, uh, and I'm going to explain you uh, each one of them in detail to give you uh, a comprehensive background of this, of this research. So the first motivation why we are interested in this research question is that um, is related to the environmental concerns and uh, climate policies. And in particular, when I talk about this, I refer to the COP21 uh, goals. And we know that one of the most important goals of the COP21 was to uh, strengthen the global response to climate change by keeping a global temperature rise uh, below two degrees Celsius. And if we read the documents of the COP21, we uh, see that they also try to highlight uh, the ways in which this goal has to be achieved. And in the, uh, in the document, they mention the, um, the idea of catering appropriate financial flows. So a very uh, important uh, focus on the financial sector and climate finance. Uh, also, they say that uh, in order to achieve this, um, this limit of the temperature below 2 degrees Celsius, we should set up a new technology framework and we should develop an enhanced capacity building at the global level. So you see how these, let's say, guidelines which are um, uh, mentioned in the documents of the COP21 clearly relate to the problem that I am interested in uh, tackle within this research. Uh, then we have another, uh, another uh, motivation related to the background of this, um, of this research, which is related to the, uh, another stream of literature, which is the eco-innovation diffusion, and in particular to the literature on the barriers to environmental innovation diffusion. And uh, here, Really, the literature is quite uh, quite vast. I only mentioned to uh, uh, bibliographic reference here, so that's the 2012 and running 2000. Uh, these are, let's say, uh, just two of the thousands of contribution on this topic, but they are uh, quite interesting in this respect. Uh, DESA et al. basically uh, provides empirical uh, evidence for four types of barriers to economic, uh, sorry, to ecological innovation diffusion. And these barriers are cost barriers, market barriers, knowledge, and finance. And we are particularly interested in finance um, uh, because we see that this is 
a kind of uh, very relevant uh, barrier for the diffusion of green technology. And also in uh, carrying out this research, we have to always take in mind that green innovation is very different from any other type of innovation because it is characterized by uh, what we call the double externality uh, feature, which means that on the one hand, and, uh, sorry, green technology reduces the negative externalities of the production process, but at the same time, it also entails knowledge spillovers and imitation effects, which produce positive externalities. So on the one hand, we have negative externalities. On the other hand, we have positive externalities. So this makes green innovation particularly um, different from any other type of innovation processes. And this is also related to the type of barriers that green technologies face uh, regarding their diffusion. So as I said, we focus in particular on the financial barriers and on the factors that affect financial barriers uh, with respect to the diffusion of ecological innovation. And in particular, regarding the factors that affect the financial barriers, we um, highlight two main factors. On the one hand, the, uh, which are both related, in a sense, to the post-crisis uh, financial framework. On the one hand, we have the low willingness to lend by the financial sector, especially in the long term. And this is related to the fact that uh, green investments, so green technologies, uh, because of their features, as I explained earlier, uh, they are riskier and so they imply longer term uh, investments, uh, which are, let's say, difficult to get uh, from, from banks. And this is related, uh, this is a problem related to the so called short termism uh, of uh, financial institutes, but also. Uh, to the financial instability. So after the financial crisis, we know that the financial sector uh, was in a very special situation, let's say like this. And um, so the financial capital was uh, really difficult to, um, to, to get, especially for small and medium firms, and especially for small and medium firms that wanted to uh, get capital for green innovation. So financial barriers are quite relevant for uh, the diffusion of green innovation, especially in uh, small and medium firms. And so if we sum up this uh, situation related to the financial sector, we can uh, say that we are uh, facing what we can call the green finance gap. So the lack of sufficient financial resources to be directed towards green investment. And why this is relevant? Sorry. Why this is relevant? This is relevant because um, this affects the transition towards a low carbon economy. So the chain of causation here is um, we have green, uh, green innovation, or we would like to have green innovation in our economy because this will uh, improve the transition towards a low carbon economy. We know that to foster green innovation in our system, we need to um, remove some barriers, which are of different types. So we have cost barriers, knowledge barriers, uh, market barriers, and financial barriers. In this research, we focus especially on the financial barriers, and we see that they are quite relevant, also because we have this post-crisis financial framework, which is quite special and quite challenging in order to increase the financial resources for green investment. So uh, what do we do? Well, in order to study this complex relationship and this complex framework of um, financial uh, financial barriers, uh, economic, um, sorry, ecological innovation, we decided to resort to the agent-based uh, modeling approach. And we decided to do so 
because this approach allows us to do all the following things. So first of all, the agent-based modeling approach allows us to study the complex patterns which uh, emerge from the interaction of consumer preferences and firm technology. Because as we will see in a while in our model, we have the financial sector, the uh, consumers, and the production sectors, so the firms. Also, the agent-based modeling approach allows us to incorporate heterogeneity and bounded rationality of our individual agents. Also, uh, this approach allows us to incorporate different institutional settings and to conduct scenario analysis and to include interactions in the financial market, which we saw is a very important player in this uh, setting of eco-innovation diffusion. And finally, all these features will allow us to study the complex technology adoption and diffusion dynamics. So in order to understand why agent-based modeling is the correct or the most appropriate um, tool in order to study all these things, in order to embed all these features uh, in our uh, research, uh, I am now going to provide you with um, a, an introduction to this methodology. So if you have any question at any time, you can interrupt me and you can post questions and I will try to uh, address all, your, uh, all the issues that can arise. So I start with a definition. So what is uh, an agent-based model? So here I take uh, a quote for, from uh, a very famous paper published uh, on nature in 2009 by Farmer and Foley, which are two big names in this uh, area of research. And they say that an agent-based model is a computerized simulation of a number of agents and institutions which interact through prescribed rules. So here we have already since the beginning a very clear um, uh, definition and also a very clear reference to some of the core elements of agent-based modeling. So computerized simulation, agents, institutions, and interaction. So these are all, um, let's say, keywords, important keywords in order to understand this modeling approach. Also, they say that uh, the agents can be as diverse as needed. So we can have consumers, we can have policymakers, we can have financial actors. So we can have a big uh, amount of agents which are different and which are heterogeneous. And another important feature of agent-based models is that these models do not rely on the assumption that the economy will move towards a predetermined equilibrium state. So no equilibrium, uh, or let's say we can have multiple equilibria, but not, we do not study the uh, economy at equilibrium. And why it is that? Well, it is that because in these models, you have heterogeneous agents, and each agent acts according to its current situation, the state of the world around it, and the rules governing its behavior. So the, uh, the behavior of agents is, let's say, richer, and it takes into account not only its own uh, actions, but also the actions of the other around him or her, depending on the, on the agents that we are considering. So here I would like to stress, again, some important keywords, which are simulation, heterogeneity of agents, interaction, and uh, absence of equilibrium. I would like also to stress a bit more uh, the, the, the definition of agent-based modeling because um, I think it's, it's important when we want to 
understand what it is about. And I follow on what I just said. So when we consider the economy as a complex system, when we want to use this agent-based approach, then um, we are not interested in studying the economy at the equilibrium, but rather we can end up in uh, a situation in which we have several stationary states, so what we call multi-stability or multiple equilibria, and this outcome can result from uh, the previous history of the system and also uh, on what is called hysteresis effect. Okay? This is quite, quite relevant in this kind of model. Uh, also, these models are characterized by what we call out of equilibrium dynamics, and also they usually behave in a non stationary way. Uh, we also have what we call self organization, which is basically, as in the mathematical models, so periodic or non periodic oscillations, chaotic or turbulent behavior. So, a very rich type of um, of behaviors that we can observe in this in these models, but for sure not equilibrium behaviors. And uh, finally, we also have what we call emergent properties, so dynamics and outcomes that cannot be understood from the properties of the single agent. So these emergent properties is something that you get only after the simulation of the system, and uh, you cannot easily infer this system dynamics uh, just by looking at the properties of the single agent, so of the single system element. And so, referring to this point, we usually say in the agent-based community that the system is more than the sum of its parts. So this is exactly to emphasize the idea that you have heterogeneity in your agent population and just by looking at each single agent is not, uh, is not easy to infer what will be the final result of your, um, of your simulation. So you can just, sim you, you have to simulate your system after having defined it, okay, after having defined the, uh, the features of the system, so the behavioral rules of the agents, the interaction uh, protocols, uh, the sector uh, features, and so on. Then you simulate it, and then you get these emergent properties. So what comes out from the simulation of this very complex structure of the economic system that the modeler sets up? Uh, and what is interesting is that um, many of these features that I have just um, described are the result of strong interactions, which can often lead to counterintuitive behaviors, which is very different from uh, the idea of deterministic behaviors. Okay, so we can have a richer set of outcomes, which is very different from uh, a deterministic outcome. Um, in order to understand also a bit more what is this agent-based approach, I think it would be interesting to have a comparison with the equilibrium approach. So to this aim, I set up this, um, this table, uh, and I use basically four criteria, no, five criteria, uh, in order to, um, to, to explain or to um, describe the differences or the similarities uh, between these two approaches. So, uh, the four criteria are as follows. So, we have the agents, the interactions, the time, heterogeneity, and system behavior. So, regarding the agents, so usually in the equilibrium approach, we have one representative agent. In some uh, models, we have two agents. So for example, these overlapping generation models, or we have an infinite uh, continuum of agents. Um, 
Usually these agents are also fun, fully rational, they are optimizing, and they have no history. So these are the core features of agents in models that use the equilibrium approach. When we go to the agent-based approach, we have a complete different picture. So in this model, uh, in these models, usually we have that the number of agents is very large, but is finite. So we don't have an, an infinite continuum of agents, which does not make any sense if you think about it, but we have a finite number of agents. So, which is large depending on the research question, but is a finite number. Then usually they are simple entities, so they do not optimize, they, do, they are not fully rational, but they can have also sophisticated learning. For example, if we think about uh, agents in financial markets, and they can also have adaptive behaviors. So the, the decision about the type of behavior depends on the research question. But for sure, we can have very different types of uh, agents, of agent behavior, depending on what we are interested in in our research. So they can be simple entities, so bounded rational agents, or sophisticated agents, adaptive uh, agents, depending on what we want to study. But for sure, you will never find a a model in which uh, the assumption on the agent behavior is the fully rationality or the optimizing behavior. Uh, and why it is that? Well, it is that because in the agent-based approach, you do not need to impose this assumption, which is usually something that you need from a mathematical point of view to solve the um, equilibrium model. Okay, so the the I would like to keep it simple in this in, in this uh, in this way, but let's say this is uh, how we can um, easily um, um, make this difference between the two approaches. So on the one hand, we have the fully rational uh, agent uh, assumption. On the other side, we have bounded rational agents or simple agents depending on what we want to study. Then the other criteria is interaction. So usually in the equilibrium approach, uh, for a long time, interaction was not modeled at all, uh, while nowadays uh, you find this, um, this uh, definition of frictions, so frictions in the financial markets, frictions in the goods markets, but this is not uh, uh, modeled uh, let's say explicitly as it is done in the agent-based approach, where you have local interactions which are very clearly modeled and path dependency. Also regarding time, there is a difference because in the equilibrium approach, you don't have time. Usually uh, time is considered not important. Also because usually these are models in uh, continuous time where so the, the, the time in, uh, in, in the way in which we use it in the agent-based modeling is not, uh, not relevant. Uh, indeed, in the agent-based approach, we rely instead on discrete time. So every agent is characterized by a set of actions which takes place according to a very detailed uh, time schedule, uh, which is, as I said, in discrete time. So we have time one, two, three, and this matters for the types of um, outcome that we want to study. And this is especially um, especially true for the uh, macroeconomic model. So the agent-based macroeconomic models in which uh, time is indeed uh, important. Think, for example, about the production uh, process. Okay, so or the um, also the, the interactions in the financial sector. So uh, every action should be scheduled, okay, because it is important that one action takes place before another action, okay, in order to have a coherent uh, a coherent um, time framework for the whole macroeconomic model. Um, the the fourth criteria is heterogeneity. 
So this is also something very relevant, and this is also something that distinguishes these two approaches, because in the equilibrium approach, we have that agents are usually homogeneous. They can be sometimes heterogeneous, so there are some uh, models that mention heterogeneity, but usually this heterogeneity means that they have just two agents, okay? And usually uh, researchers in this area say that diversity does not matter. That's why they can work with the representative agent. Uh, the agent-based approach instead uh, mentioned that diversity matters and agents in every sector that you, uh, you have are persistently heterogeneous. And they can be heterogeneous, for example, regarding the income. So you have income distribution. You can have uh, different firms with different price uh, setting mechanisms. You can have banks that apply different interest rates according to different uh, criteria that they want to use, for example. So heterogeneity matters in agent-based models, and you have persistent heterogeneity in every sector of the, of the economy that you, uh, that you model. And finally, the last feature is system behavior. So system behavior, this relates also to the type of assumptions regarding the agents, because the, in the equilibrium approach you have that the overall system behavior is optimizing and only equilibrium states count. This is what researchers are interested in. Maybe you can run, uh, you, can, you can apply a shock and then study what happened to the economy in order to return to the equilibrium, but it is a kind of equilibrium uh, analysis, always. While in the agent-based approach, we are not interested in um, equilibrium, um, the, the study of equilibrium states, but rather to the um, adaptive behavior of the, uh, of the economy. Um, and we are interested in the emergent properties. So we start from very heterogeneous agents, very heterogeneous sectors. We simulate them because it is not possible to solve these very complex systems mathematically. So we need computer simulations in order to understand or to study the emergent properties. So the outcomes of the interactions of the complex sectors of the complex agents. Also, what is interesting to, to mention here is that the uh, agent-based methodology um, is actually um, a, it comes from the cross fertilization of different, different approaches. And maybe with this uh, figure, it is a bit clear, uh, clearer what I mean. So what I mean is that agent-based computational economic models, which is, as you can see, at the interaction of these three circles, is the um, outcome, in a sense, of the cross fertilization with mainstream economics computational intelligence, and also psychology. Indeed, if we think about the evolution of the agent-based approach, we know that uh, agent-based models have been taking a lot of results from behavioral economics, which is a stream of research which is definitely coming from the mainstream economics approach. But agent-based models are willing to include a lot of uh, results from behavioral economics research regarding, for example, the assumptions on the different types of behaviors of the agents that you have in this model. Also, the ABM approach takes a lot from the computational economics, which is, again, a stream of research that um, derives from the mainstream economics. So the use of computers and uh, simulation in order to solve very complex uh, mathematical systems. Also, um, we take a lot from uh, computational intelligence research, so especially to, to model the behaviors of the agents, 
So artificial intelligence, uh, um, very complex models of uh, agents' behavior that use very complex uh, models of behaviors um, which are derived from computational intelligence. And also we take a lot from psychology. And again, we take a lot because we want to model the behavior of agents in a way which is closer to empirical evidence. And empirical evidence which is derived especially from experiments with, uh, with real agents. So uh, this is just to say that the agent-based approach is a very, um, in a sense also in, in itself, it's a very complex approach to economics and it tries to, uh, to get different influences from different fields of research and especially from mainstream economics related to behavioral experiments, from psychology and also from uh, artificial intelligence research. But how is an agent-based model implemented? Oh, I see there is a, there is a, Yeah, I know. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just. I would like just to finish the methodology, and then maybe we can have a, a small break. So, how is an agent-based model implemented? So, we have a um, we have several um, steps uh, when we want to implement an agent-based model, and here I took this feature, this figure from a. Uh, a paper that I published in 2017. If you are interested, you can you can have a look at this paper in order to uh, learn a bit more about the agent-based methodology and also about the evolution of uh, methodology in the macroeconomic research. But basically, the idea is that we have different steps, and these different steps is that we start from the definition of a theoretical model after having a clear research question in mind. So research question, we build the theoretical model, so I mean the mathematical equations. Uh, then we build the algorithm, algorithmic structure of the model, and we have to implement a qualitative validation, meaning that we have to see if the model is a good representation of a set of data which are related to our research question. Um, so we have a first validation step. If this validation step is passed, then we start to code. So we start to transfer the mathematical modeling into a piece of code depending on the type of, um, of, of um, uh, software that we want to use. So I don't know, MATLAB, R, Java, C++, depending on the on the uh, type of uh, software that we want to use. Uh, so we code the, uh, our model and we um, simulate it. So we have now the empirical, sorry, the, the agent-based model. And after the simulation of this model, we want to empirically validate it. So we want to see if what we are doing is consistent with some data that are relevant for our research again. So you see, we have different steps of validation for our model so that we are sure that what we are doing is not just some random stuff, but it is related to, let's say, reality in a sense. And this is especially relevant for, the, um, for models which are then used to inform policymaking. Otherwise, we cannot be sure that what we are getting is interesting or meaningful. So this is the, the point of all this. So we have empirical validation, and again, it is passed or not. So if it is not passed, we have to go back to the coding step. Otherwise, we have to run what we call sensitivity analysis. So we have to change some parameters in order to see if what we get, so the results, are robust by changing uh, some parameters uh, of the model. And again, this uh, validation is passed or not. 
if it is not passed, we have to go back to the coding step. Otherwise, we can have the final agent-based model. So we have the results, we analyze them, and we get the conclusions after understanding the output of the model. However, we know, as um, Emanuele said yesterday or mentioned yesterday, that these models are um, uh, or have to face a lot of critiques. And one of the uh, most, in a sense, famous critiques are that they are black boxes, as Emanuele said yesterday. Another critique is that they have too many degrees of freedom because we, uh, we have ad hoc assumptions regarding behavioral rules. And another critique is that uh, related to validation because they say the, the um, people that um, usually cre have a critical approach to the agent-based modeling, they say that they have a poor link with data. However, here I mention a lot of ways out for uh, addressing these critiques, okay? And related to the critique of black boxes, uh, well, yeah, I, I can understand this critique, but there are a lot of ways to have that agent-based models are not black boxes. And here I mentioned some of them. So one uh, way of um, having a clear understanding of what is going on in the model is to use ODG protocols. So overview, design concepts, and details. So these are protocols that modelers have to write down or are willing to write down. It's not uh, necessary, but in order to enable for more transparency of the model, you can write an ODD protocol to explain um, how you design your model, uh, what are the uh, parameters, why you have some uh, interaction uh, mechanisms and so on. So this is a way to make it clear what is there. Then another uh, way is to promote reproducibility. Okay, so to make that the model is reproducible also by other researchers. So you are willing to share your code, you make it open, everybody can use it, can run additional analysis and check if what you did is um, correct in a sense or it is biased by some um, mechanism that you included into your model. Or you can use unified modeling language, which is a language that allows modelers to make clear how each agent is uh, modeled, how the model is structured, and so on. You can also use counterfactual analysis, sensitivity analysis, or rely on modeling principles. Regarding the too many degrees of freedom uh, critique, well, as I said before, usually agent-based modelers rely on the research output of experimental economics or behavioral economics in order to, uh, to model the behavior of their agents. So there is a very strong link with the empirical literature, okay, and the experimental evidence, which uh, basically makes this critique really, um, uh, let's say, not, not, not true in a sense, okay? Uh, and finally, regarding the validation, so the poor link with data, it's really not true because especially in the last uh, 10 years, there has been a lot of development in um, research um, on how to validate this kind of model. And there are a lot of statistical methods that we can use in order to validate these models. Here I suggest for those who are interested this uh, reviews of, of methods by Fagiolo et al. in these two papers, which are quite, um, quite interesting for, for this, method, for this um, topic. So this is just to say that in this uh, area of, of research, we are aware of the uh, problems uh, of the modeling approach, but we also know that there are a lot of uh, ways in which uh, the situation can be improved, and is actually improved um, in, the past, in the past years. So now I'm going to present you the features of the agent-based model that uh, we implemented in order to study the um, Financial, how the financial barriers can be removed in order to enhance the uh, eco-innovation diffusion. So 
So hopefully now it is a bit more clear um, um, the, the, the methodology that uh, is behind this uh, agent-based model study. Uh, okay, so in this model we have a production sector with heterogeneous, heterogeneous firms and these firms compete in a market and receive goods demand from the consumption sector. Uh, the firms have the same cost structures, the markup is fixed and they offer goods that have three different qualities. We have user quality, which is a feature which is positively evaluated by consumers and is basically the performance of the product, the product when it is used by consumers. Then we have efficiency, which is the preference of consumers for cheaper products and is a negative function of the price. And we have environmental quality, which is uh, positively evaluated by consumers and is negatively related to the environmental impact of the product. We also have product innovation, which is the only process by which firms can improve their competitive position in the market. And this technological landscape, which is available for firms, is constrained. And so the innovation, the R&D, is used by firms to improve one of the three product qualities. So efficiency, uh, environmental quality, and user quality. These are the three main features of the product, and they are at the core of the innovation dynamic. Um, each firm has its own innovation strategy, and this is determined by probability or probabilities to engage in some specific R&D projects. And these probabilities are the strategic profile of a firm, which at the end determines the innovation pattern that they will follow in the uh, R&D process. And once the type of innovation project has been chosen by the firm, it tries to get a loan to finance it, because here the assumption is that firms resort always to external credit, so they ask to a bank for a loan when they want to have an innovation project. So when they want to compete with others in order to improve one of the three products characteristics, they have to ask the bank for getting a loan. And here, this uh, banking sector is quite uh, important because, as I said, we want to study the financial barriers and we want to study the role of a state investment bank uh, when it is present into the system, what happens to the eco-innovation diffusion. Um, and so to do so, in our uh, model, we have three different behaviors of financial actors. So we have the standard commercial bank, which uh, lends in a pro-cyclical way and the uh, provision of loans for innovation depends on the financial soundness of the firm and on the phase of the business cycle. So basically here the idea is that if the firm is not credit worthy they will not get the loan and um, if the uh, economy is in distress so we are in recession, there is a lower probability to uh, get the loan. And also we have, as I said, the public investment bank whose lending is counter-cyclical according to a, um, empirical evidence. And the interaction between the commercial bank and the public investment bank uh, takes place according to the subsidiarity principle. So here the idea is that we have a collaborative private public financial sector and the uh, public investment bank is not a competitor of the standard commercial bank but rather it contributes to the commercial bank's willingness to lend to green innovation pro projects. Um, yeah, this is the uh, flow chart of the financing process. Um, basically, uh, this is to show you that uh, when the firm decides to, uh, to uh, 
perform uh, an innovation investment, it has to request a loan to the bank. The bank, once uh, receives the, uh, the loan request, it computes the firm financial solvability, so it has to decide whether it is credit worthy or not. And if it is credit worthy, then the uh, loan is granted, so the innovation process can start. If it's not credit worthy, so the loan cannot be granted, the innovation process is stopped and the firm has to go back to the initial request and go back to, the, uh, to this process again. Okay? So if the innovation project is financed because it receives the loan, uh, we have some probability that the innovation um, basically is successful. And if the innovation process is successful, then the firm is able to improve the feature of the product uh, according to its own, um, its own decision. So it can decide to improve the, uh, the green quality, the cost quality, or the efficiency quality, okay? depending on its initial decision, okay? and depending on the fact that the loan is granted by, by the, the bank and by the uh, probability of success of that project, then the innovation is implemented. And when it is implemented, then the firm increases the, um, the performance of one of the three uh, qualities of the project. And we will see why this is important. This is important because, well, I can anticipate, it will uh, define the market dynamics and also the type of uh, eco-innovation diffusion into the system. But before going to the results, I also have to mention that we would like to look at the, uh, the, the, the aggregate income uh, dynamics, so the GDP basically of our models, which, uh, as we model it, depends on the types of innovation which is performed by firms and also by the type of finance which is available in the economy. And this is the, how the growth rate uh, is computed, and you can see, so I would like to point your attention to these omega uh, terms here. So according to empirical evidence, we modeled the uh, contribution of different types of innovation to, um, to the growth rates of our economy. So the idea is that environmental innovation contributes positively to the uh, GDP, Product innovation, uh, omega B, also uh, um, contributes positively to the growth rate, while process innovation, so uh, innovation for efficiency or cost reduction, contributes negatively. Okay? So, as I said, if you read in the paper, I also mentioned all the, uh, the, the literature that we use it in order to, uh, to set this uh, relationship of innovation with uh, the growth rate of the economy. But this is the idea that we have. So we have firms, we have demand from consumers, we have an innovation mechanism, uh, we have a financial sector, so commercial bank and the state investment bank, we have the subsidiarity principle, and we are also interested in see what is the effect of um, different um, innovation types and different uh, banking sector behaviors on the uh, aggregate GDP. Uh, before uh, before uh, getting the results, I also performed a validation step of the model. Uh, as I, I told you, we need several uh, validation steps in the in the uh, model uh, methodology. So I validated the model, and basically I am able to say that this model, um, this model uh, replicates three basic, um, three basic stylized facts. One of these is that uh, uh, research and development investments are procyclical, as I show here. The other one is that the firm size distribution is right skewed. And the third stylized fact is that the growth rate distribution of the GDP is also fat-tailed. 
And I mention also here the literature that uh, talks about the, um, the empiric effect. Oh, excuse me for a moment. Uh, we do have a question at hoc, and that is, it is not really clear to uh, some listening people why process innovation adds with a negative sign to your function. Yeah, I see now the, the question. So, yeah, it's, um, as I said, we read on the um, empirical literature, so there are some empirical works. Now, I don't remember the name of the researchers that did this, you know, this, uh, this research. But uh, I can tell you later, or you can uh, just read in the um, in the paper. So I mention all the these these details in the paper as well. Now I don't remember the name of the uh, of the researchers, but we found this uh, in the literature basically. That's why we have it here. So this is not just a random assumption, but we relied on the empirical evidence to to put this negative sign here. Okay. Maybe um, I can also point uh, Mr. Lavecchia to, to this literature later on uh, if he's interested. Yeah, so as I said, we uh, validated the model. So uh, in this way, we can say that the model does not do, uh, let's say, crazy things. So the dynamics are um, the basic dynamics, the dynamics of the baseline scenario are. Uh, meaningful because we can replicate some uh, side effects that we find in the empirical literature. And now we move to the simulation. So now we, um, we, can, um, we can see what are the results of the simulation. So as I said, in these models, we use discrete time. So every uh, action is scheduled. Uh, and what is important is that we have a um, list of actions which take place in a very precise order. And in this case, the order is this one. So here I point out the main actions that take place in the model. And every action takes place, uh, as I said, according to a specific time schedule. So the firms uh, activate the production, then the uh, consumers make the choice based on their uh, preferences for the goods qualities. The firms decide on the type of innovation project that they want to, um, to implement. And here, the, the winning decision for firms is to implement a type of innovation project which is in line with the demand from consumers. This is quite clear, okay? Demand supply should be, uh, let's say, um, aligned in order to be successful uh, from the firm perspective. Um, then the firms decide to activate the loan demand if they want to implement an innovation project. The financial sector evaluates the loan demand. If the loan demand is, demand is successful and uh, the uh, probability of innovation is um, high, then innovation is implemented. And if innovation is implemented, uh, then uh, firms, it means that firms can sell their product to consumers so they can compute their profits. But if at the end of this process, they, um, they are bankrupt, they have to exit the system and they are replaced by, by new firms. And then we start again with this, um, with this a sequence of events, okay, which takes place at every time step of our simulation. So what are the scenarios that we uh, implement? So basically we implement three scenarios plus one baseline that we use for testing. And for each scenario, so we leave this aside because this uh, scenario one is just a baseline scenario. These other three scenarios, basically in every one of them, we have once uh, we simulate only with the private bank and uh, in another setting, we also include the state investment bank. So we implement this subsidiarity principle that I described before. So the idea is that we don't have two competing banks, but we have a state investment bank which supports the uh, private bank, um, so the commercial bank, in the uh, financing of the green, um, the green innovation. 
And so we have basically, as I said, baseline scenario, then a scenario in which the preferences of consumers are uh, the same for every, uh, for every feature of the product, for every quality of the product. So they are set like this. Then we have a set in which the uh, preferences of consumers for the green quality are set very low, so like this. And then we have a set in which green innovation is hampered. So we have some um, additional barriers for green innovation to, uh, to take place, and this is the probability that the green innovation is successful is just 40%. And as I said, for every uh, scenario, basically we have once the role of the commercial bank alone and another setting in which the, uh, we also have the state investment bank. Uh, now I'll show you the results. So in the baseline scenario, basically what we learn is that innovation drives the success of the firm. So we have different demand landscapes that reward differently uh, the different firms. In each of the three uh, cases for uh, preferences for the different qualities. And also we learn that in order to be successful, a firm has to innovate the product quality which is uh, more in line with the consumer demand in the market. Okay, this is quite straightforward, but uh, this, this is something very important for the dynamics of the model. And then we move to the other scenarios. So one scenario, as I said, is the one in which we have that consumers have the same preferences for all qualities. And here we distinguish the results between when we have only the commercial bank and so basically these two plots on the left, and on the right, we have the uh, results of when we also have the state investment bank that, that um, is active into the system. So what is the idea here? The idea is that uh, firms that focus on only one dimension are basically kicked out of the market because firms that, um, only firms that uh, divide their innovation investment over the three qualities can prosper. And this is in line with the idea that the innovation decision should be um, uh, basically on the same uh, level of the consumer demand. So if consumers have that their preferences are equally distributed among the three types of qualities, Firms that decide to innovate only on one quality is not uh, successful, basically, in the market. So they are kicked out very quickly uh, because of market competition. Um, initially, the firms uh, find it profitable to innovate in cost effectiveness, okay? Here's one. But over time, further cost reductions do not bring additional benefits. So, do not bring additional market shares, so firms focus on the other two qualities. And when we are in presence, so we see this here, when we are in presence of a state investment bank, the situation is a bit more complex. So the dynamics in the market are a bit more complex, and the average level of green quality grows more at the beginning. So you see this one is the average um, uh, green quality grows more than the other two qualities. Also here, the average green quality. Uh, because the firms that act in this setting, okay, when the state investment bank is active, knows that the bank is there. So they know that uh, it is more likely to get uh, investment, sorry, to get loans on green investment, so they um, target green investment as well, and so the average green um, quality increases over time in this setting, when the state investment bank is also present in the system. And over the simulation, uh, firms gradually decrease the probability to invest in green pro pro projects as you see, so at the beginning is very uh, high and then it decreases the probability to invest in green. 
um, in order to balance the total number of funded projects because they know that the preferences are equally distributed so they have to be smart and balance their decision of innovation. Then what happens when we have that the uh, consumers have low preferences for green? So we want to uh, test the case in which they are not interested in green products. What happens? So of course, uh, because of the relationship between demand and supply, as we modeled it in the, mo in the, in the model, uh, lower levels and decreasing pattern of green quality is observed across the world simulation and in both cases, okay? Uh, and these patterns, as I said, are consistent with the dominant demand type. So here the dominant demand type is a preference for the other two types of qualities, but not for green. So green is really going down. And so there is a fall in the propensity to innovate in green quality, but an increase in the probability to innovate in user quality and cost reduction. Okay? Exactly as we see here. So the probability of innovate green goes down, but we have an increase in the other two. In the presence of a state investment bank, uh, the user and cost quality dominate over green. Okay, this is clear again. This is consistent with the dominant demand type and the probability to innovate in green increases until a point in which investing in cost reduction brings more advantages. So we have a small increase in uh, average green quality here. Uh, we also have a higher propensity to innovate in cost reduction, this one and a lower propensity to innovate green because fewer investments are needed to increase the number of green projects. Again, because firms know that a state investment bank is there, so uh, they do not, do not have to fight, in a sense, to get uh, financial, uh, financial capital for green investment. So all in all, when compared to the framework without the state investment bank, we observe a higher level of green quality at the end of the uh, simulation. So this is what I want to emphasize here with this circle. So here, without the state investment bank, the average green quality is very low. Here it's a bit higher, okay? So you see, if you see also the scale of these two plots are, is the same. So here we can actually see an increase in the average green quality at the end of the simulation. And finally, what do we have when the green quality is hampered? So what, what, when basically we say that there is a very low probability that the uh, green innovation is successful. Well, in this case, we have uh, basically a combination of lower preference for the green quality on the demand side and a low propensity to innovate in green projects in the firm side. And here it's very clear the strong role of the demand side because it really affects the type of innovation diffusion. And we observe higher levels of efficiency and user quality in both settings. So in both cases, so the case in which we only have the private bank and the case in which we have the state investment bank, in both cases, this is winning, okay? These are the winning strategies so cost reduction and effectiveness um, with respect to the green, which is really not, uh, not the winning strategy, so it goes down, okay? And, but also in this case, when we have the state investment bank, okay, the, uh, we observe higher levels of green quality when compared to the other case. So also here, at the end of the simulation, we observe that green quality is a let's say, performs a bit better than in the other case, and this is just a, a sign of the positive um, effect of the presence of the state investment bank. The last uh, set of results concerns the um, 
the, the dynamics of the GDP. Okay, so also here I report basically the GDP dynamics for the three different scenarios that I just uh, described. So equally distributed preferences, lower preferences for green, and hampered green innovation. And in both cases, uh, sorry, in the three cases, I uh, I, I provide the uh, the plot for the case in which we have have the commercial bank plus the state investment bank and only the commercial bank. So as you can see, just a quick visualization of these three plots, it's clear that the state investment bank has a positive effect also on the uh, GDP dynamics, okay? Because in every case, the GDP goes up. Um, and um, so not only goes up, but also it grows faster because these uh, plots uh, are the log GDP. So we can see the growth rate of uh, GDP. And uh, so we have a growth rate effect and also a, a level effect, okay? In both cases, when the uh, state investment bank is active into the system. And the other result, very clear from these simulations, is that uh, consumer preferences play a big role in this dynamic. So when consumers attach the same preferences to the three product characteristics, so here, the GDP is higher than in, idea, in all the other cases, okay, and grows also at a faster pace. If you compare these three plots, this one is the, the case in which we have a faster GDP growth. Uh, in the other case, uh, when we have low preference for green um, and hampered green innovation, GDP growth is a bit uh, lower. So all in all, what we can say about this uh, simulation. So first of all, we have a positive aggregate effect of the subsidiarity principle. So this idea that you have a, a state investment bank which helps in a sense, the, um, the private commercial bank to, uh, to, to uh, finance green innovation helps in rising the level of aggregate green quality and also to improve the green propensity to, to innovate of the, uh, the firms in our system. Uh, and also we observe that the highest level of green quality are achieved when we have this state investment bank in the system and when this is combined with strong consumers' preferences which are oriented towards the green quality. So the combination of um, a, a, a financial sector which, is, uh, which aims at uh, improving uh, ecological innovation and the demand side, so green preferences from consumers, the combination of these two features makes the system better off regarding the eco-innovation diffusion and regarding this green GDP growth. However, uh, we have also some uh, policy implications of this, uh, which should be uh, taken into account. And first of all, uh, one thing that we have to mention is that when we look at the uh, empirical uh, evidence, so what is actually um, uh, in the real uh, economy, okay, um, the so-called Paris effect on climate finance is not there. So basically we did not observe an increase in climate finance so far. So as big as it would have been needed in order to uh, keep or limit the, uh, the growth of temperatures, uh, as it was uh, mentioned in the Paris Agreement. Uh, but we see that there is a potential crucial role for public investment banks. And usually uh, these two public investment banks are mentioned as the very successful cases. So the Brazilian one and the German one. However, from a recent research that I conducted on the German case, uh, we have some problems also there. So, of course, there is a positive, uh, a positive contribution of green investment banks, and for sure there is this positive contribution also in Germany. But what we see here 
is that, uh, so for example, if we look at this graph, we see an increase of investment, total investment in renewable energies over time. So starting from 2000, we have an increase in total uh, investment in Germany for renewable energy and then a drop, okay? And this contributed for sure to the improvement of the, um, the um, so, so, so the, the emissions of the country, okay, to reach some targets. But as we can see, the country, so Germany, is still very far from this climate neutrality uh, objective that it has for 2050. So the country is here. So 2020, we are here, and the country should reach this level here of total um, emissions. And the investments so far are quite high, okay? We don't see any investment gap in Germany for a long time. Just in the last year, we, we observed an investment gap, but it's not enough. Okay, it's not enough for the very um, challenging objective that also Germany, which is usually mentioned as a very successful case of uh, targeting uh, GHC uh, emissions or of uh, public um, investment banks. Okay, also in this case, there are a lot of problems. Uh, and so, in my view, this calls for a greater commitment of uh, the private financial sector. Okay, so we need additional resources from the private financial sectors to increase climate finance, to uh, improve mit mitigation measures. But we also have to keep in mind uh, climate-related financial instability uh, possibilities, okay, that are always there. And, uh, okay, this is the, the, the topic of another research that I'm uh, carrying out, but I think this is important to link. So the, uh, the public investment um, uh, bank research with the uh, private financial sector dynamics, because these are uh, for sure both needed in order to um, improve uh, the low carbon transition that we are all talking about these days. So I think I finished with this. I think I'm also a bit late, just five minutes, and Thank your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so I would invite all the participants to write their questions or suggestions into the chat. Uh, to give you some time to do so, I would probably ask some questions myself now. Um, so, if I understand correctly, in your model, you have basically two kinds of funding institutions, which are the private banks and the state investment bank. Yep. And, and as we know, innovation, almost by definition, is a risky business. I would uh, assume that these innovating firms need some kind of risk absorbing capital or some kind of risk absorbing funding. And we know that bank loans are not very much risk absorbing. So, I wonder whether you could add some kind of venture capital or other forms of risk capital to your model and then whether that makes a difference. So that's my first question. And another issue is that we know also from the literature that um, technological innovations can be quite disruptive and are also seen as a source for transition risks that come from an unanticipated mm -hmm. shift. So my question is if uh, in your model there is a lot of uh, technology diffusion going on, would this then increase the transition risk for the whole economy? And, and how, or how can this be modeled? And, and finally, because you also have this uh, nice property of your model that you can actually distinguish between different consumers and a different consumer preferences. We also know that uh, a large uh, preference shock to consumer preferences might also increase transition risk to the economy. And I just wonder whether that uh, can be also included. So um, that would be my question. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think I can answer to them while we wait for other 
questions for from the audience. Um, yeah, they are all relevant points, what you mentioned. And um, so regarding the, the capital, um, the absorbing capital at the bank, uh, no, at the moment, it's the bank in this model is very simple. Uh, but uh, I am going to, so I am developing another model, another agent based model. And in that case, I have a very detailed banking sector with all, where all these, um, um, let's say, considerations regarding the, 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 the bank capital can be done. So in this model, no, I cannot do this. Uh, where we could we could uh, extend it to include these uh, these features, but uh, I am now working on a different model. Uh, and for sure, what you mentioned is relevant, uh, and is relevant also to test what happens if you if you have different uh, capital regulations in that sense. But in this model, I don't have. Uh, also, yeah, technology is very important for transition risk, and also this is something that I did not test in this model, but I have it in the other model that I'm working on. <laughs> this is definitely something that I have, um, I am introducing, and I want to test what is the effect of this. Uh, the results are not ready yet, but when they will be ready, I will be happy to share it with you. And the same is true for consumer preferences. Okay, so the idea of this model that I presented here was to have a very, uh, in a sense, simple model uh, to highlight the role of this state investment bank. But now I'm working on a much richer version of these dynamics on a different model, and I want to include all these things. So what you mentioned, all these three points are very uh, relevant, and they, they will be all included into this new model that I'm working on. So hopefully it will be ready by the end of the autumn. So I will be glad to, to share it once I have the results. Thank you very much. As I do not see any, I, mean, I have one more clarification question probably. Uh, the state investment bank, how is it different in uh, terms of funding conditions from the private bank? Do they offer a lower interest rate in their model or why is it actually attractive to firms to take out loans from the state investment bank? No, it's not a, an, an, an interest rate. It's just um, that they contribute with additional funds to the uh, funds which are extended by the private bank, basically. So that's why it's a subsidiarity. So they, in, they intervene with additional funds which are put into the uh, balance sheet of the, of the commercial bank so that there, there is higher and a higher quantity of uh, capital available for green. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, if there are no further questions, basically, basically, I, I would like to thank you very much for your presentation. Thank okay. you for the slides that you have shared with us. Uh, I think we will distribute them among uh, the participants. Yeah. And, and anyone has any question, I'm also available via, via email. So. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, so then uh, for the rest of us, I would suggest we have a break until 11, and then we continue today's session of the summer school. So see you later in about 20 minutes. So welcome back, colleagues. Um, now we have uh, another presentation by Sandra Batson, uh, who is on the phone now because we do face some technical difficulties, unfortunately. I would like to introduce her briefly. Sandra is a senior researcher at the Bank of England, and uh, as you might know, the Bank of England has been very active in the field of uh, the analysis of climate change and its financial stability and its other economic uh, implications for quite a long time. The Bank of England is actually also uh, a member of the main PFS of the network for growing the financial system and has been one of the leading members, I would say. <clears throat> and then Sandra very much has been uh, at the forefront of this research and then has started to do so very uh, soon, as you can see from her 2016 plus paper, let's talk about the weather, the impact of climate change on central banks. 
Um, I would also like to use this opportunity to uh, voice my uh, concern that uh, the Brexit actually has now taken the Bank of England out of the European system of central banks, where we had very uh, good and productive research collaborations. But nevertheless, as I said before, within the NGFS, we are still collaborating uh, with our colleagues at the Bank of England. And so I would like to give the floor to Sandra. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andreas, for inviting me. It's a real pleasure um, to be here. Um, so I started working on climate change uh, in mid-2015 as part of a bank research project on climate change um, that was focused on, on the implication for central banks' objectives. And, ever, and since then, I've moved towards uh, focusing on macroeconomic implication of climate change uh, from the point of view of central banks and uh, monetary policy authority. Um, the second slide is really important. It's probably the most important slide uh, of my lesson today. Uh, please um, remember that these are my personal views uh, based on my work and my research, and they do not represent uh, those of the Bank of England or its three policy committees. I'll start um, as an introduction, and in particular, um, the role of climate change for central banks. So this is slide four. Uh, so the initial focus or attention of um, the, uh, the study of climate change and central bank was on financial stability risks, um, both from climate change itself and the transition to a low carbon economy. Um, and the question was whether climate related financial risks were priced in asset values. But more recently, in the last few years, the attention is also focused on monetary policy implication of climate change. And there have been some notable speeches from monetary policy authority. So the, um, the definition of climate risks starts with identifying a climate hazard. Um, this is on slide five now. Every type of climate related risk is defined as the um, probability of a given hazard um, multiplied by um, the consequences. So the way the consequences is the weight, and they can be physical, economic, or financial. Um, consequences of um, climate hazards depend on things like vulnerability, exposure, and so on. When you think about climate-related economic risks, uh, you can think of a problem in many dimensions. So on slide six, um, I show three possible dimensions. On, on the vertical axis, uh, I, I've shown the hazard. So as I will discuss later, uh, we can think of two main kinds of um, climate hazard, physical and transition hazards. The other dimension is the economic impacts um, that can affect demand, supply, prices. Uh, and also relevant um, for macroeconomic is the timeline um, over which these effects uh, crystallize and manifest, and um, so short to medium versus long term. So the plan for the rest of the talk is to um, define and describe physical hazards and transition hazards, and then discuss the economic impacts, um, and also touch on the financial stability impacts which have uh, feedback effects on the macroeconomy, so they're important from that point of view. Slide eight gives um, a summary of the economic implication of climate change and their timing. Um, so extreme um, weather events are also called acute hazard. Um, they can cause unanticipated shocks to component of demand and supply, um, very much like traditional macroeconomic shocks, and they tend to crystallize in the short to medium run. Um, Gradual global warming is also called chronic hazard, and it's a progressive shift in climate pattern, such as increasing temperatures that lead to sea level rise and changes in precipitation. Um, and, and this kind of risk causes a um, more gradual and predictable, predictable structural change in the economy and tend to crystallize over the medium to long term, long run. The transition risks arise from moving from a fossil fuel driven economy to a low carbon economy. And they can result in both shocks or more predictable effects um, and can materialize both in the short term and in the long term. 
most of my, of my, mater of my material I will refer to in this presentation is included in some paper that I've written with uh, my co author Yannan and Misa, and are listed here on slide nine. In particular, the second and fourth papers focus on the macroeconomy, while the first is a more, uh, as broader, um, it talks about the impact on, on, on central bank objectives, and the third focuses on financial stability aspects. I also put the link to the Bank of England Climate Change webpage, which has a list of all the initiatives, including the policy and the research papers. So to focus now a little bit more on physical risks, on slide 11, I define a physical hazard, um, again, as a raise in temperature and sea level rises and increase in rainfalls. And, um, a second aspect, the increase in the frequency and severity of climate-related events, such as um, floods, um, windstorms, and extreme temperatures. So these two types of uh, hazards are not uncorrelated. There is a growing area of scientific research called event attribution, which studies the extent to which climate change influences the likelihood and severity of specific weather-related events. So the American Meteorological Society publishes a number of studies explaining extreme events from a climate perspective. Um, So how can, you, how can we um, then assign probabilities to these types of hazards? Um, so the chronic hazard, the increase in temperature, is where a large part of the climate change model uh, focus. Uh, so the well-known integrated assessment models uh, combine a climate model with an economic model. The climate model investigates how changes in carbon emissions translate into carbon concentration and ultimately increase in temperatures. These models often have a long time horizon. Um, and it, 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 one can easily dismiss them as, as not being relevant for uh, macroeconomic and monetary policy. However, the acute hazard have shorter term impacts and so are very relevant for the economy. So in chart 12, um, you see the projection on rainfalls and heat waves for the UK under two different um, scenarios uh, about climate policy. So the top um, row is a high warming scenario represented in concentration pathways 8.5. The bottom row is a low warming scenario where climate policy is aggressive and keeps temperature at um, below um, a target. So we can take this um, to um, extreme uh, scenarios, combine them into a sort of a funnel that represents um, the, the, the space, the probability of physical risks. So there will be a distribution around each of these uh, representative pathways. But essentially, um, what he's saying is that physical risks um, tend to grow with time, even if in, in, even if in a, in a um, low, con low concentration scenario, right, like 2.6. So as an example um, of a way we could use um, climate projection to operationalize the um, climate risk is, for example, to look at the projection of specific type of climate events. So slide 14 shows projection for the precipitation in, uh, in the UK uh, for the next two decades compared to a reference period of 1986-2005. So precipitation in the reference period are in the blue lines, whereas the projection for the next two decades are in the um, pink diamonds. And you can see that um, the projection for the precipitation in winter months are already uh, higher than the reference period over, the over this decade and the next. So we could use this pro these uh, probabilities to assign um, to our climate hazard. Chart 15, slide 15 shows the same um, for uh, temperature. 
So temperature also project, projected to be higher on average in every month of the year over the next two decades compared to the reference period. Um, this study also sh showed that um, heat twists are projected to be 3% three three more likely on average over this decade and the next with, compared to the reference period. So these um, charts are um, uh, derived from data from the uh, World Bank, which um, collates the results of a, diff of a set of di different set of climate models and combine them into one set of projection for each country at a different um, time horizon. And they can be used to assign probabilities to specific climate events uh, to a specific country or region. On slide 20 now, I, am, um, I would like to give you an example of the challenges um, that a climate policy um, faces. The UK have um, uh, signed up to a net zero emission target for the UK. So the Committee on Climate Change, um, which is an independent um, climate change um, organization, has assessed the requirement for achieving a net zero emission by 2050. So it has a sort of identify three um, different scenarios. One is the core scenario, and it refers to the previous target of redu reduction of 80% of emissions compared to 1990s. Um, this scenario is, uh, reflects the current um, government ambition, uh, although not necessarily policies already implemented. It covers um, a number of sectors, and it's broadly in, in line with achieving an 80% reduction. Um, further ambition would allow to achieve a 96% reduction compared to 1990. This would require both changes in um, behavior, uh, consumer behavior, and also um, more advanced technologies that are not currently uh, ready and they will require higher costs of um, research. Finally, the scenario that, that allowed um, achieving the net zero target will require, alongside you know the first and the second scenarios, um, further changes and significant additional society and behavioral changes, more ambition, um, greenhouse gas removals from the atmosphere and maybe the invention of new carbon neutral fuels, which are not currently available. The technologies required have a very low level of technology readiness at the moment, so the cost of um, developing and implementing them would be very high. So the conclusion is, although the target is achievable, it's extremely uh, stretchy and challenging. How does the climate policy, how is the climate policy reflected in practice in um, the economy and economic impact? So, um, slide 21 is taken from the um, Bank of England uh, paper, discussion paper on the um, climate change stress, stress test. And it shows some illustrative pathways. So it's probably easier to start from the right-hand side of the chart um, that shows the temperature changes. So to achieve, the, the objective is to achieve a given um, maximum level of temperature change, say two degrees. Um, and the policy action can be either early and, and, and more uh, smooth, as indicated by the blue line, or it can be um, later requiring um, a, a steeper um, action um, later on. So the later policy action will, will <clears throat> mean higher increase in temperature earlier on until the policy is implemented and that uh, temperature will start decreasing. The purple lines that indicates that what would happen in, in, in in absence of additional policy action for temperature would just increase. The central panel shows um, 
the the password the password emission. So in a, in in uh, absence of additional policy emission will keep going. Um, an early policy action would allow a uh, um, gradual and sustained reduction in emissions from, from day one. A late policy action would require a larger decrease in emissions because um, while we wait for action, the emissions increase concentration in the atmosphere. So a, a stronger reduction would be required the later the policy is introduced. And finally, in the first uh, chart shows how these policies translated in, a, in practice in a carbon price. So the early policy action would uh, mean um, a smooth path for a carbon price, or a late policy action would uh, mean that the carbon price needs to uh, be hiked uh, at a higher level. If the policy action is later, the, 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 the carbon price needs to be higher. Um, than it would have been with an early policy action. So this is a kind of um, experiment and, and, and pathways and projections that um, policymakers look at, and, and in particular the first chart to understand what the impact on the economy would be. Um, so the climate policy is the, 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 the biggest uh, transition hazard. The other two, uh, technology and expectations. Um, I'll just spend a few words. Um, so from the so technology potentially would have um, big effects on the economy. In particular, the transition would also um, result in, 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 in a big structural change in the economy with some sector uh, contracting and some other sectors expanding. Um, it has to be said then from the central bank point of view, um, the structural change is only relevant to the point that it leads to significant um, needs allocation. I'll, I'll, I'll explain it a bit later, a bit more later. Um, what's important is that if technology is, um, the new technologies are important, then potentially they could spill over to other sectors of the economy, not just the, say, the, the carbon sector, the energy sector, or the extraction sector. They could spill over to um, other sectors of the economy, and they could lead to an upward risk to economic growth, so faster growth than projected, particularly if the, if the decarbonization scenario is the ambitious one. Another risk for uh, the economy from the transition is, is given by expectation of sometimes called sentiment. So consumers might uh, change their habit, consumption habits. They can they could uh, boycott some products. They could even protest. Um, investor could um, divest of fossil fuels. So these are also um, sources of potential risks. Most likely the, the transition will be driven by a combination of these three elements. Um, and so it's important to understand also how they interact. It is quite difficult to assign probabilities to the transition hazard. So just focusing, for example, on the policy this is on slide 23. This is um, a very stylized personal interpretation of how the probability of transition hazards could manifest over time. So as the as, as time progresses and there is inaction, the, the probability of having to take action on climate change is, is likely to, incre to increase. Um, possibly due, due to the manifestation of the physical um, uh, climate change events, um, big, large floods, large um, physical impacts that can trigger um, political upheaval or, or protest and that could push um, the climate regulator to take action. So there is likely that the risk, that the probability of climate 
um, policy would increase over time up to a point where finally the action is taken, so then obviously the answer will decrease. The reason why I'm stressing this is because when you combine this with the, the, the profile for the physical hazard probability that I showed you before, um, which is now combined to, in slide 24, when you combine them, you can see that, you know, over the first, the next decades would see an increase in both pipeline rates both physical and transition risks. Um, even if climate policies are introduced now, they would have to take time before their effect is uh, visible on, on the physical risk, so for physical risks to start reducing. Um, so while sometimes people talk about a trade-off between physical and transition risks, say, oh, um, in absence of policy, fiscal risk will increase, but in, in the present of policy, also the, the, the transition costs are higher, the physical risk will be lower. Uh, I don't see it as much as a trade-off as people maybe original <laughs> self thought um, in the past. It feels like there is a period where both types of risks will be um, increasing. So obviously the idea is to try and quantify this risk. So I showed you some uh, um, earlier some charts of projections of physical risk that can be used to quantify these probabilities. Um, quantifying the probability of transition risk is harder, harder, um, and I think it's very early days. Uh, so my next session is about economic impact. Um, <clears throat> but if there are any questions, uh, uh, not, do I need? Not so far. I mean, if I may, maybe interrupt. Uh, do you understand me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, because now you mentioned this uh, question of the correlation or negative correlation between physical risks and transition risks, and I think there is actually a strand of literature that says that. If we have uh, more transition risk from a very strict transition and a very quick transition, then we can reduce the emergence of physical risks uh, later down the road. Wouldn't you subscribe to that view? Yeah, I initially thought it made perfect sense, but um, so my view is a little bit more pragmatic, and um, it's true that if there was um, early aggressive action on climate, we would see physical risks decrease. Um, but the, the actual chance of that happening is, I think, is quite low, given the current um, fragmentation, I think, of the debate and the, the policy action. I think, you know, it, it is an unlikely scenario. So I think the more likely scenario is that um, policy will be delayed, in which case you would see um, both risks rising in the, in, in the in near future. But as I said, you know, that um, red comes um, chart is, is, is my personal view um, now. If, if, if you want a challenge of this literature um, based mostly on, on kind of pragmatic and, and um, you know, assessment of the current state of policy rather than um, a theoretical assessment. Um, so it, it's just my, my personal view. It's just a challenge of, you know, um, it could be that it's not all a trade-off. It could be that we actually will face both risks. Um, but it's a personal interpretation. Okay. Um, so, um, so when we talk about economic impact, I think this is where um, the that there is that there was a, a lot of gap in the as I was you know reviewing the literature um, on climate change and economic impacts in the past. 
uh, from the from the point of view of the central bank, I I felt there was a lot of focus on potential supply, long-term potential supply. Um, so the <clears throat> the standard uh, treatment of, of climate economic climate impact in, in, in climate or integrated assessment model is through uh, climate damage, uh, by which temperature reduce uh, GDP by, you know, a given fraction every period. Um, there wasn't even an agreement on whether this um, climate impact should be on the level of GDP or on the growth rate. Um, but in general, I, I, I found this um, treatment unsatisfactory. Uh, for, for the central bank, it's really important to understand um, the balance between demand and supply. Um, and so if, you, if you're still thinking about climate change in the broader sense, you can see that it affects a lot of um, economic quantities, not just potential supply. So in this table on slide 26, I have tried to summarize a lot of the literature that actually does look at um, the specific components on demand and supply. Um, so starting with demand, um, you know, the uncertainty and volatility. So these are, for example, this table um, focuses very much on the short to medium term impacts, um, which are more relevant for monetary policy and, and, and central banks. So, for example, the uncertainty and the volatility uh, due to extreme climate um, events could lead to uncertainty and therefore uh, discourage business investment. Um, physical damage, uh, the manifestation of the physical risk, such as floods and, and windstorms, could um, lead to damage and depreciation of the housing stock. And if there was a wealth effect, from housing to consumption, then that would have real effects on consumption. Um, the, the, the literature on uh, physical climate risk and trade is quite well developed. There are a number of papers um, that show that um, natural disasters affect disrupt input and export flows by disrupting communication channels, for example, and uh, also production. And finally, um, government is also exposed to climate change physical risks um, in terms of losses of its infrastructure and its large structures like schools and hospitals and, and, and other types of buildings. On the supply side, which is a little bit more developed, um, extreme weather events lead to loss of our work and therefore uh, decreased labor supply. Um, they could also lead to input shortages, such as food and energy in particular, and also damage to the physical capital stock and infrastructure. Also, adaptation to climate change in terms of um, adapting your physical capital to the physical risks will divert resources from investment, from, from productive investment to adaptation investment. Um, so that would also have an impact on physical capital. And finally, the supply, the technological aspects of, of uh, technology, technological progress. Um, again, the, the, the short-term physical damage might divert resources from innovation to adaptation. So we need new innovations to um, find new ways of adapting to climate change, and we divert resources from um, creating new ideas and new products. So these are all kind of short and medium term effects, but of course, you know, there is a much bigger literature on the longer term effects, which includes, you know, things like climate induced migration, conflicts, and increased effects on health, such as, you know, worsening uh, health in terms of higher morbid morbidity and mortality. So um, what is the empirical evidence? On slide 27, um, uh, there is um, a possible pathway. So the literature is pretty much in agreement that the, on impact, 
natural disasters, including climate-related um, weather events, have a negative impact on GDP so immediately after the event. But then the, 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 the issue does not agree on whether um, this leads to uh, creative destruction, so we rebuild better, so higher uh, um, path, or you revert to trend, um, so you keep go you, you catch up to the growth uh, path that you were following before, or there is a lack of um, reconstruction and therefore a permanent loss of level GDP. So this is a possible kind of pathway that people have thought about, and the the papers are listed on the right hand side on the top are examples of empirical evidence that looked at the impact of natural disasters on GDP, including weather events. Um, so this, this literature is quite, is quite broad. Some, some papers look only at the impact on GDP. A few new papers start to look at the impact on um, the components of GDP, such as trade or consumption and investment. In practice, central banks respond uh, differently to natural disasters, depending um, on their assessment of the magnitude and of the impact. So, for example, after Hurricane Katrina in 2005, uh, the Federal Reserve um, kept to the uh, expected policy before the disaster, which was to increase interest rates. Uh, so essentially treated um, the impact of Katrina as a transitory, um, a temporary effect and did not change its policy. Uh, by contrast, the Bank of Japan, after the great East Japan earthquake, um, decided to ease monetary policy uh, by expanding its asset purchase program uh, to preempt uh, deterioration in business sentiment. And finally, uh, the Bank of Thailand also cut policy rates after the 2011 flood. This was particularly bad because it, it generated losses of 11.6% of, 11 of Thai GDP. Um, so it had a particularly strong effect. Um, what is the if, um, There is more uh, growing evidence of also inflationary effects on natural disasters. So you can see tentative evidence from the chart of um, um, <clears throat> the impact of a Russian export ban on um, commodity prices and therefore food price inflation um, in the mid uh, um, um, so the 2000s. But evidence, recent evidence has um, also strengthened this um, sort of anecdotal uh, evidence. So Hainan, uh, I found a large inflationary, inflationary impact of extreme weather events in developing countries. A part and more recently has also confirmed this result and has also found that effects are heterogeneous across different disaster types. Um, and also this inflationary effect in developing countries uh, could spread through international commodity trade. So this is really important uh, for, uh, you know, uh, central banks in, in, in um, developed, developed economies like the UK or, or, or the US, especially the UK. So there's always this sense that, the, you know, the UK is completely sheltered from the physical impact of climate change. If anything, the climate would become warmer. Uh, and um, you know that there is even a, a, a sense that the, the, the estimate that the actually initial impact would be uh, positive because of the w warming temperature. But one really important channel through which uh, the physical impact of climate change affects an economy is through international trade. Um, so Piersman found that exogenous international food commodity price shocks have a strong impact on consumer prices in the euro area, for example. So to the point that these shocks can explain, uh, on average, between 25 and 30 percent of inflation volatility um, in the euro area. So while um, the temptation is to dismiss the impact of physical natural disasters on the home economy, the international uh, imported inflation is also is a really important channel for central banks. 
um, so on the, this this uh, table on slide 29 um, includes some further references and mostly referring to the UK um, of specific types of impact on the different channels of demand and supply. So not just looking at the uh, final results on GDP or inflation, but looking at different channels. Um, so, for example, there is evidence on, um, you know, house prices effects, which could affect consumption. There is a lot of evidence on trade, um, some evidence of reduction in labor supply due to heat waves, for example, or flooding. Um, cost of, um, you know, water um, scarcity, which could be caused by natural disasters, and uh, also cost of flooding, damage of flooding to the infrastructure. So the, these studies would um, help giving, you know, a specific cost to the impact of each different disaster. So one can think of building, uh, if you want, a bottom-up um, approach to estimating the impact of natural disasters on GDP, rather than relying on top-down approaches, which are typically um, use a regression approach, where you include a dummy variable for a natural disaster and you see whether the coefficient is uh, significant, significantly different from zero. Um, you can, this is like this would be like a top down approach looking, you know, requiring data across countries, maybe or regions. But you can think of um, a bottom up approach where you have defined the hazards, you have estimated their probability based on, um, if you want, climate projections, weather projections. And now you, have, you can use this study to as assign a cost. Uh, to each of these types of events, and therefore you can think of building a kind of sort of ready reckoner that will help you uh, if you want forecast GDP in the short term. If you know that, you know the impact of if you know that say heat waves are due to increase by a certain percentage per year, and you know what the impact of heat waves is on the supply or other aspects of GDP, you can in a sense incorporate that. Uh, if you want in your forecast, so this is a little bit of a you know a wish, a wish, uh, an idealistic view of how central bankers could um, use this approach of estimating the risks bottom up. Of course, the evidence on uh, longer term effects so of temperature rises um, is, is much wider. So slide 30 just has three, you know, three most important papers, um, starting with Dell. Um, so these studies typically use, um, you know, short-term changes in temperature um, to estimate the impact on, uh, on GDP. Uh, Dell and others in particular use, um, study the impact on, on economic growth, and we found an effect in poor countries. Uh, Burke and others use a nonlinear model. Um, the most recent work of uh, Khan and others is very promising. Um, it has um, because it is it, it, it's very um, it's an attractive approach because it's based on a theoretical growth model to derive the empirical specification. It also controls for the endogeneity in temperature <clears throat> because that's you know models of climate and economies tell us the um, economic growth has a feedback effect in terms of higher emission and therefore increasing temperature. So, um, Khan and others highlight that neglecting this endogeneity uh, bias the results. And they do control for that and they find that um, they find an increase, um, so reduction in GDP uh, depending on the um, increasing temperature, and, and they also find different effects across countries, um, as shown in the chart on the right hand side in that slide. Uh, okay, so I'm moving on to the 
um, input of transition hazard, um, unless there are any questions so far. Oh, no, we don't have any questions, so please go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> 151, <clears throat> um, look at the impact of transition hazard. So, uh, this is, um, there is, there is less, um, a, 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 there is a smaller um, literature on this impact, in particular on the channels that we can, that we can um, rely on. Uh, to estimate this, this um, impact. In, terms of in, in, theory, in theory, again, uh, transition risks affect all the components of demand and supply. Um, so, for example, climate policies could cry out both consumption and investment if they, um, you know, if they take out some um, expense that the private sector would have done. But similarly, um, other authors uh, emphasize the fact that there could be climate policy could be crowding also could be also crowding in investment um, by encouraging private sector investment into say um, low carbon technology. So you know it's not just one sided. Um, I think that in this table I wanted to focus on the negative impacts. Um, so, you can think that asymmetric climate policy could distort uh, the, the trade uh, flows, um, and you could also imagine that inefficient climate policy would be a cost um, to the government. Um, in terms of supply side, is climate, climate policy and in general transition could lead to um, and misallocation of both capital and um, labor, and a risk to energy supply, um, and also the technology, in, you know, technological innovation required for the transition could uh, create uh, uncertainty. Um, I think one important thing that has been highlighted in the recent literature is this uh, conflict of premature capital depreciation and, and scrapping or what people some, um, also call physical um, asset stranding. So some, some uh, fossil fuel technologies uh, will need to be abandoned. I'll say a bit more about this later on. Uh, but that will cause um, the capital stock in given sectors of the economy, particularly mining, but also other energy uh, industries to become uh, unusable earlier to have a, a premature depreciation, uh, which could have uh, economic impact. So on, 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 on slide 32, I have some uh, examples of empirical evidence. Quite a few uh, papers talking about the uh, impact of existing climate policies on things like uh, companies' um, employment and productivity. Uh, started also some impact, macroeconomic impact of stranded assets um, fossil fuel, I'll discuss what stranded assets are uh, a bit more in detail. Um, in general, different models trying to assess the impacts of decarbonization policies on UDP um, get different uh, results depending on the assumptions. And often studies that look at the cost of different policies, only look at direct costs and don't tend to include static effects and, and, and tend to uh, forget about any dynamic effect of these policies. So this, um, the, I think the process for estimated the economic impact of transition risks is, or transition hazards is still um, a little bit uh, in its infancy. Um, so the next slides are the next two slides are a little bit of digression also on the impact of climate change and natural rate of interest. Um, I will just keep, briefly skip through. Um, so this is another price that is really important to change banks. Um, is the rate of consistent with state inflation when the economy is going in a trend, so in steady state. And based on the classical growth model, we can think of all the, the, the theoretical determinants are of uh, the natural rate of interest. And on slide 34, um, the table tries to understand 
uh, of all these drivers of R, um, what the impact of climate change could be, so both in terms of policy, but also in terms of um, physical impacts. And, um, you know, again, it's early days of this kind of thinking, but you can see that climate change potentially could affect all the main drivers of interest rates and could therefore have an impact on the natural rate of interest in that is very relevant for central banks. So to conclude, um, if from, from the monetary policy authority's point of view, <clears throat> The most important aspect of physical risk is that um, physical, short, short term physical hazards can have a non negligible economic impact, um, even over a short term forecast horizon for inflation and GDP. Um, it also likely to increase the volatility of output and inflation and therefore make it harder to assess um, and forecast these quantities. In terms of transition risks, carbon prices um, would have an impact on inflation when it's introduced. Um, most people will say you can tend to look through this impact because it's a one-off increase and the inflation, impact on inflation would be temporary and therefore a central bank can look through this, um, this change. Um, you still need to understand and um, understand that that could be the impact, that could be the effect of the policy. Um, <clears throat> understand what the impact might be ex ante, so you know whether it's realistic to look through. The impact could also be slightly more persistent if it leads to change, dramatic changes in relative prices. Uh, so again, it's something that maybe central banks need to understand um, a little bit more. Um, there could be also risks to economic growth, so upward risk if uh, there are significant technological spillovers from the transition and low carbon technologies, but also downward risk. So the, it, as I was saying before, the, the structure change that the economy would need to go for to transition to a low carbon economy doesn't need to be the best thing for the economy. It would only become an issue for the macroeconomy if it leads to significant resource misallocation of its policy is a significant drag of resources uh, for economic growth. Um, but again, this is not necessarily the case. What important is for um, their implication also for the analytical framework of central banks from understanding the impact of weather impact, like um, some other some examples in central banks already, Gorio and, and Russian Gorio, to understanding also the impact of climate change on on um, the data. So this paper by Bodwin and Wright shows how the um, deviation from seasonal norm affects the the data. Um, and the seasonal adjustments that we currently use. How can we incorporate climate effects in our current uh, central bank tools, modeling tools? Um, so one example is a paper by Keenan Packer that includes um, climate damage in a GSG model. But also we would like to incorporate the um, the policy effects, not just the physical risk, but also the policy risk. So how would we incorporate that? Uh, and finally, what new modeling tools uh, we could uh, think of? I'm sure uh, throughout the school you will see examples of um, new models that could be uh, used. So I'll just go very quickly through um, this financial, financial stability impacts of climate change um, because they're relevant for um, the macroeconomy and their impact on the macroeconomy. So um, physical impact, um, <clears throat> the differences is very much, depends very much on whether the, uh, the losses are insured or uninsured. Um, if they're insured, that the insurance would um, <clears throat> suffer losses. So, sorry, this is slide 38, it's a kind of simple diagram. Um, losses 
insurance will suffer losses. If they're uninsured, then it would be the household and businesses that will suffer losses, which could uh, put them at increased risk of default and cause um, losses for lenders, which is called the credit risk. So these losses for lenders could spill over to the macroeconomy by um, creating a credit tightening, that, which could have real effects. So that's one possible feedback channel from um, the financial stability impacts of climate change. The transition uh, risks are very much um, represented by this, the concept of stranded assets. So this is financial assets rather than physical assets. So absolutely significant breakthrough in climate technology, um, achieving the 2%, 2 degree uh, limit on temperature increase will necessitate substantial reduction in carbon emission and estimates um, include, say, that up to 80% of coal, existing coal reserves, 50% of water reserves, and 30% of gas reserves. Uh, would have to stay in the ground, so it would become unusable and therefore stranded. And the question is, are these risks incorporated into asset prices? And so for assessing the, the financial stability implication of stranded assets, you can think about carrying out a risk assessment in stages from equity market through to credit market and uh, any risk of, of contagion. Uh, so slide 40, starting with equity market, you can think about companies that are more directly impacted um, by climate policies, such as um, typically fossil fuel producers, coal, oil and gas companies, so first tier, but also second tier companies. There are companies that have um, very high energy intensity and therefore would be also affected by the climate policy for increasing energy costs. Um, then you would assess the risk of contagion. So slide 41 gives examples of how um, you know financial markets could amplify um, the, the carbon asset stranding through um, contagion or uh, increased market volatility. And slide 42 will kind of summarize this in a, in a, again, in, in, a, in a simple diagram where uh, climate policy could lead to stranded assets, uh, financial assets that could um, increase the risk of default of some companies and, and, and lead to credit risk again. Um, but also sentiment uh, of investor, investor sentiment could lead to asset devaluation and therefore uh, repricing in equity and bond markets, which could also lead to financial constraints. And both these channels could lead to a uh, reduction in business investment and therefore have real effects on the macroeconomy. So I have kind of summarized these two um, channels in the last uh, slide, slide 43. Um, so this is the transition risk. It shows how um, there's both uh, spillovers from um, real economy to financial stability, but also feedback effects. Um, so the spillover, so the, the blue, the, the blue boxes are the real economy side, and the kind of yellowy ones are the financial stability side, and. The purple line show how the um, financial stability effects, so, so how the effect of climate policy could um, spill over into the financial markets, whereas the red arrows show how financial market effects could um, spill over into the macroeconomy. So, you know, financial market losses leading to lower business investment or credit crunch lowering. Uh, leading to lower household consumption. Um, so these two aspects, this macroeconomic aspect and the financial stability aspect, are not at all <laughs> not separate, are very much interrelated. So even if you're only interested in the macroeconomic impact of climate change, 
and you're in a central bank, <clears throat> you need to pay attention to the potential spillover from the financial stability. Um, and of course, the, the, the key challenge is quantifying these channels um, and making them operational from a um, central bank point of view. That was my last slide. 